Come on in, rotters. Welcome back to Blamed, the podcast that takes a deep dive into the best worst horror films of the 80s and 90s. I'm Stevie, your VHS veteran. Thanks for pressing play, and I hope you're all doing horrendously. I've been getting some really great film suggestions from some of you who've emailed in to steviesbrainrot at gmail.com. Uh, Verity has suggested Trick or Treat from 1986. That's the one with Gene Simmons and Ozzy Osbourne, which I've never seen, but perhaps I'll cover it in October when I plan to release a slew of Halloween-themed episodes. Uh, Thomas White has suggested Alligator from 1980, and uh, that and its sequel are firmly already on my list, so your wish indeed will be granted, Thomas. And Johnny Coffeen sent in no less than 13 suggestions, and every single one is on my ever-growing list of trash. So keep them coming in, because my episode schedule is already shifting around due to these suggestions. So, on to the shunt. This week I'm covering the vivacious and viscous Society from 1989, Brian Usner's directorial debut after producing films like Reanimator and From Beyond with the late great Stuart Gordon. If you'd like to watch the film before we chat about it, it's currently streaming on Shudder. This week, my guest is a joyous, multi-talented chef, award-winning food writer and huge horror fan. It's only bloody Gizzy Erskine. Hello. Hi. Are you all right? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm so, I, I'm freaking out a bit because I have to say, I'm so intrigued by you and your life. Like I was doing a little bit of digging and um, I'm so, it, it sounds absolutely fascinating. So you were a body piercer, then you placed top at the Leith School of, is it food and wine? And you're a chef, uh, a food writer, a podcaster. I mean, what the fuck it's amazing <laughs> and actually now i think i want your job so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, we should probably say that i actually stalked you in order for me able to come on this show you actually sli- <laughs> it could it's, it's like your own podcast you could you slipped into my slid into my dms didn't you yeah i like i'm such a big horror movie fanatic that um that i actually this is the most authentic thing like i was it was in the middle of the night and i was i couldn't sleep terrible insomniac always have been yeah. and listen to podcasts and I always like classic me five o'clock in the morning what can I listen to something about horror and I just fell I fell into it literally Amazing. and listened to like two episodes uh in one night and was like I'm doing this Sweet. whether he likes it or not he's, oh. he's gonna have me on <laughs> no I'm so chuffed and yeah you say you you are a, a big horror fan but particularly sort of b-movie right yeah and, uh... I even started to write a b-movie a while back um, oh did you that's, yeah that's how much I I really, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to do like a, I was actually talking to quite a famous uh, producer who does kind of like lots of, lots of big, big movies and uh, yeah. wanted to do a short mm-hmm. um, and actually something that was kind of relevant to food. And I kind of, I wrote this, I wrote this script with them uh, and we only got so far. I actually, I got too busy. I ended up, ended up in the States for normal work and I, we never actually right. followed up on it, but it's something now the last week I'm like, hmm. Maybe I could do that. <laughs> if it's sitting around somewhere. I think a lot of um, films, a lot of people's first films sit around for like eight years and then they pick it back up and then suddenly make a masterpiece. It's probably been about eight, week, eight years as well. Well, there you go. <laughs> and isn't, isn't your, like your favourite, is it Brain Dead? Yeah, I was gonna, if I had to say it, would be, it would be Brain Dead. Yeah, and for, for um, American listeners, Brain Dead in America is called Dead Alive. It's the 1992 yeah. Peter Jackson, yeah. Um, yeah, P- I mean, that was always like, oh, everyone loves bad taste. And I was like, no, I loved Brain Dead. Yeah. And I remember listening to one of your previous episodes where you said you wanted to do prosthetic makeup and mm, yeah. things like that. And um, 
my sister was upset. We, like, we used to watch it and we used to make plasticine models of everything when we were way too young. I've got to be honest, like pro- probably about, I'm, I'm going to say 12 or 13 years old, like obsessed. <laughs> yeah, that, or those, um, those really inspired me, especially Peter Jackson's, because I've mentioned it before, but they feel so homemade because they are, you know, he yeah. just uses raw materials and crude shit that he can find and threw it together. And it was genius. Well, you'd be, you'd be really surprised as a chef, like when I used to be a food stylist, so, I, I went from um, chefing to I went on this intern placement to a BBC to work for BBC Good Food, and when I was uh, there, I sort of worked with those food stylists. And on one of them, I was working on a, a movie where we had to make sort of brains and uh, well, brains were quite easy, but like really horrific th- stuff and out of loads of stuff you wouldn't expect. So um, I actually learnt quite a bit on on this job as well. <laughs> Sweet, I want to talk about. 1989's Society. Had you seen, heard of it, what? I'm so shocked to say that I had never heard of it. And uh, I say shocked, but because obviously it sort of fits into that remit of um, something like Brain Dead mm. and the fact that it's a gore fest. There's no getting away from it. It's yeah. it's exactly my sort of film. I mean, it's yeah. it's kind of ridiculous, like they all are, to be honest. It really is. And um, <laughs> obviously it's... it's um, Obviously, it's got this allegorical tale about the upper class and the one percent, and um, I didn't notice any of that. Like all these films I revisit, the, the the better ones always have this metaphor or underlying message, which I never saw as a kid. And obviously, this one, it's not at all um, try, try, subtle. There are no undertones. It's very much surface. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think I, one of the things I, I I wrote was my first thing was uh, cannibalistic society, maybe a metaphor for the modern Tory party. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was just like, this there is really go. interesting, and, and like, what it sort of it sits in the uh, how we, yeah, yeah. It takes it's a subversive take on the the class divide, and it, and it, it yeah. really focusing on the upper, and um, it it depicts this theory that the upper upper class are actual different species altogether, and they feed off the lower classes. In the film, they literally feed. Well, not even feed; they absorb them to yeah. spike the bloodline. It's absolutely genius. And if people might not have a clue what we're talking about right now, so can I ask for your... Give us a little sort of synopsis for someone who maybe hasn't seen it. Okay, so I I have said, society is like Cronenberg has made Beverly Hills 90210 on bad acid. (laughs) (laughs) Bad trip, yeah. (laughs) It's a scathing take on the 80s yuppie culture and the social elite. Our main character, Billy, is a popular jock at high school who lives in his mansion in the hills, but begins to suspect there is something deeply sinister within his family and friendship group. As he starts to dig... Friends and believers around him start turning up dead uh, as the film slowly (laughs) spirals into sweet, fleshy mess of paranoia, unbelievable levels of gore, incest and 80 shoulder pads. Mate, that is banging. That was the most stressful thing I've ever had to do, actually. (laughs) (laughs) I've never actually had to write a review of a film before. I was like, shit. Well, (laughs) you absolutely nailed it. That's right. And um, yeah, actually, you touched on incest there and that even in horror films yeah. that's often given a wide berth it's like so taboo yeah. and also looks kind of at cannibalism which is also really taboo uh, that you also don't see that often there was a film uh, called raw in 2016 oh. right and that does it so well but not often do you get a film that actually touches on that sort of taboo subject well i mean raw for me is really in my sphere at the moment i hadn't i hadn't seen raw until uh i would say the last month mm. but um i don't know if you've been following the army hammer case of course i yes. knew you would <laughs> yes and i mean i mean well i'm obviously nothing's been uh confirmed or proven yet but but very interestingly it sort of sits within uh the room of both both society as a film you know you've got uh, army hammer from a long stretch of hollywood elite yes who, um who has been accused of uh several albeit maybe fetishized uh mm-hmm. cannibalistic acts and yeah. uh one of the films that he uh was sort of pushing as a, one of his big loves of his life was raw right. um so Goodness. i watched it and was like yeah it is yeah it's a hot topic so um but that's always the way isn't it when you when you pick up a a retro film suddenly it's 
ridiculously relevant for the current time. No matter what it is you pick up, you go, fuck, this is totally about now. And that always, always happens. Um, So some fun facts. Well, or not so fun, um, but just some facts. Um, So it was actually, it was a huge hit in the UK, but it absolutely bombed in America, this film. And I wonder if that has something to do with us having a monarchy and blue bloods in our oh, system. Yeah. You know? uh, and Brian uh, Usener, the director, he said that in an interview that I saw that um, most or a lot of Americans think of the upper class as a myth. Like it's a fairy tale that doesn't exist, that it's a made up society that um, is a uh, folklore. Certainly, certainly been exposed this this way. Well, <laughs> right, again, there you go. <laughs> Topical. Uh, um yeah, I guess, I guess so. I mean, I guess, yeah, Amer- Amer- but then I would have thought the Americans would have absolutely gone wild for it. I guess, yeah, it's, I suppose it's fantastical because they don't have to experience it. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, it was made for two million, which I think uh, they did pretty uh, pretty well with that. And um, it was originally, um, the script, it was written by um, two guys called Rick Fry and Woody Keith. And um, originally it was about, about a blood cult in Beverly Hills, um, but Usner dropped it and changed it to this surreal, gooey, visceral, sort of viscous <laughs> stuff. And um, so he swapped blood for bodily fluid yeah. and, and lubricant. Um, And actually, I think that was also a thing to do with uh, ratings and uh, censor, because if you don't show blood, you've got more chance of getting less cuts. But in America, it was absolutely ripped to pieces and cut so much, yeah, which really sucks. So I imagine that's why also it bombed, because you need that climax, that payoff. But do you remember back in the 80s and like in 90s when we were watching these films, it was like the the sort of if if something had bombed or if something had been... uh, like cut to shreds because, so to speak, because of um, because of sort of um, it being monitored. I those are the ones that I always wanted to watch. Of course, because you're like, why the fuck was it been cut? What, yeah. What is it you're trying to keep from me? <laughs> you yeah, have yeah, to for see sure. it. And of course, <laughs> and I think doing that by the time you are able to release it uncut, that is going to sell so much more, and the weight has um has built it up in your head. Uh, so of course I th- I always th- I don't think it's a hindrance at all. Not at all. Um, yeah, I, I must say it's been the, even the, even the fact that it's gone from sort of talking about being a, bl- a blood cult it, all the way into sort of cannibalism and and gore is kind of interesting because it's very interesting. Even if we refer to back to the army hammer case, there's been so much about it that sort of like that's the border of of this sort of, the whole thing being considered okay as sort of the the blood cult of people. Back historically used to bloodlet. So um, I don't know if you remember this. I mean, I think I'm a bit older than you. But when I was uh, a teenager, I was a punk and I used to hang out with loads of goths. And um, I was actually quite cute. This is a, the sort of weird thing about this. <laughs> the goths used to like bite holes in each other or poke holes in each other and suck each other's necks um, to bloodlet. Um, and historically, uh, it was it's sort of like something that was actually meant to show this huge dedication towards your love for one another. And it was actually quite a romantic idea. Wow. And there were people who used to, I remember, I mean, I, I've never done it, but there were people who used to sort of do um, little sort of spikes on the back of their neck. And they were like, it was so cute. My boyfriend just hugged me and like suck on my, the, sucked on the back of my neck, spooned me and right. sucked on the back of my neck all night. And I'm like, okay, that could be sweet. <laughs> Oh wow! No, we 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 didn't have that. But also, I no, you know, I'm sure I, most people didn't. Let's well, no. Also, I went to a a, a theatre school, so it was a, that's a completely different world. You know, where the, the highest form of bullying was laughing if someone couldn't do a triple pirouette. It was really a different <laughs> a different world altogether. So we were in quite a bubble there. So we are no bloodletting in no. our in our no. hallways. No. Um, Not a relatable no. thing we got going on here. <laughs> No, but the thing is, I'm up. I'm up for trying everything once. So um, maybe right. uh, that's that'll be my new my new task to uh, bloodlet someone. Um, right. So this film. I mean, I could just chat with you to be honest and forget the film. But um, <laughs> yeah. we. Uh, so yeah, you mentioned we meet our protagonist Billy, who's your typical '80s teenager, uh, and he's uh, at the beginning. He's kind of having this night walking nightmare, where he's in his house uh, at night and hears all these whispered voices and distant laughter and he grabs a knife and it's a uh, sort of a dream it's not quite established if it is or not but it's a uh, it's a a foreshadowing of to, uh, of the end of the film really and um and then straight away he's in a shrink's office and he's mm. saying that he's uh, he's worried that something's going to happen doesn't he and um 
this is uh, this is a wonderful moment because he he grabs an apple from the um the shrink's uh, fruit bowl, takes a bite, and it's covered in worms. I mean, ridiculous amount. It's like forty worms, and that there's a lot of worms used as as uh, props in this movie. Yeah, that's right, and I I think also that's so deliberate because it's something about something that looks shiny and fresh on the outside, but inside it's rotten. Which is the whole setup for the whole of the Beverly Hills elite in this towards the end yep. of the film, not ruining it for anyone. Um, but someone gets literally turned inside out, and they are filled with maggots and worms. So rich people basically, the messages are rotten on the inside, even though they look fantastic on the outside. And um, yeah, as I said, it's just not subtle any of this. It's great though, and there are some not one-liners and several just phrases that sum up, that you could just take any one of them and put it on the front of the video to sum it up. Oh, completely. I mean, like, that's very, really, really interesting that you've picked up on, on the sort of bad apple situation because I've, I've written exactly the same thing. So like you said, all these metaphors are, like, so glaringly in your face. There's no there's no escaping them. Um, the, the therapy sort of side of things I thought was quite interesting, particularly in that day and age as well. Like, I don't... I can't remember... Um, I literally can't remember the first film that I saw within that that wasn't sort of like a slick, slightly more more elegant film that had therapy in it. Mm. I certainly don't... Mind you, I suppose, actually, I take that back. In um, in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, they definitely had quite a bit of therapy oh, yeah, that's, at one that's, stage. Especially in the, thir- in the third one, yeah. Yeah, which is the best one. Yeah, of course. Dream Warriors, <laughs> that's the one. And um, Oh, actually, on that, number three and four, um, the uh, Screaming Mad George, he did the effects on those two. Exactly. And, um, number four, there's the bit where Freddy exposes his chest and you can see all the souls of the uh, the children that he's oh, killed God, and yeah. the faces. And he designed that, that massive chest plate. And um, that is so similar, actually, to what happens towards the end of the film. It's that stretched skin and stuff. So he has this real surreal, visceral style, which I love. Um, so we meet, um, this is the first time we meet Billy's sister. So uh, Jenny. And um, th- this is a very <laughs> strange moment because... Um, she, yeah, she's getting ready uh, for her. She's got the party or her coming out, is it? Yeah, so it's it's kind of like, I'm, I'm imagining it to being like a society coming out party right. where you're, what's it called? You're, um, yeah, that's what I'm trying to think. I'm sure there's a word for it. There is a word for it. It's, uh, God, it's not an initiation. It's a, I'm That's what I, I I'm nearly Goog- said initiation. I'm Googling it because it's, yeah, but it probably is an initiation no. if you're a cannibal, let's be honest. <laughs> um <laughs> God, what's it called? Um, society Initiation. coming out. It's not coming out. Ball is called debutante ball. There we go. It's there like your you debutante. Go. Or uh, or uh, uh, I can never I can never say this word. I should be able to because I'm posh. Is it co- cotillion? Sure. It's yeah? like, well, you convince me. <laughs> yeah. I think it is. My mum will be telling me off like she's somewhere like getting ready cross with me for getting it all wrong. But um. Yeah, so, and she's, she's, uh, it sort of starts with her in that um, she's obviously got a, a love, a lover who's kind of like a bit pissed off with her and stood in love and feeling some weird vibes and, Well, yeah, because you know, bro- he's hiding in her closet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really dodgy. It's so dark. And then, you know, she comes out and you think almost, you know, like with most horror movies uh, where the, that first scene is going to be really gory, but you know, actually, it's her just having to deal with this, like, slightly uh, love-obsessed ex. Yeah, that's right, because uh, her clothes are sort of moving on their own, so it's a, fa- it's a, 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 a false scare, isn't it? You think it's coming. And, yeah, so it's her ex um, who is trying to warn her about something and saying something weird's going on. And um, so Billy and Jenny, they get rid of him, and the parents are downstairs. And um, everyone seems all right, though, because, I mean, it's a criminal activity, what he's done. He he could face a litany of charges, but everyone's just like, oh, it's fine. Then, as you say, you don't really get any gore or anything, uh, like in other horror films that kick off with it. It's a real slow burn in that way. But we do get our first moment now when he zips up his sister's dress. And part of her back near her spine is sort of pulsating. And yeah. this is great, though, I think, because it immediately lets us know that Billy is alone and that even his family are suspicious and maybe something p- part of something that he is not. And he, I mean, he dresses differently as well. He doesn't fit in their conservative mould, does he? No, not at all. Um, and, you know, it's it's kind of, you know, it's got everything, as we said before, about sort of that whole 90210 you know, they're all very good looking. They're oh, yeah. all very primped and preened. Um, it's sort of, you know, when she's when she's getting dressed and the boyfriend comes out, it's it's that 
really early days of um the girls are it's really virtuous um you yeah, know yeah. They're, everyone's tits and arse are out basically of course and um literally livid that i don't look like that anymore <laughs> absolute fury um it's very specific though it's there's such a specific 80s body type that i just don't think you've seen since the 80s it's so weird i know that doesn't make any sense but <laughs> yeah. it just is i wish you did maybe we should try and bring it back <laughs> it's quite a good body type <laughs> I'm, I'm all i'm all for a shoulder pad anyway and that, i love the boxy look i love the boxy look and 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 they sort of like i love the fabrics even Oh, I'll get to it later, but the scene at the beach, those bikinis oh, yeah, are quite yeah. something. And yeah, this whole house, everything's sort of pastel, isn't it? And that real yeah. Beverly Hills. Yeah, the and also like all the fabrics are um, velour or mm. um, what's the sateen? Uh, and she's got her dress, which is actually quite nice for an 80s dress, I'll be honest. Um, and uh, yeah, so, she, you know, as you said, she takes off, starts to do the dress up and it's all, also a little bit, incestuous at this point you're yeah. a bit like what's she really asking for here yeah you're right there is there is there's something immediately there you feel immediately uncomfortable with the goings on within this family yeah and the, the mum and dad how they're sort of appeasing this boyfriend being a weird stalker it's like huh? so you sort of know immediately what's going on but not what's going on <laughs> but you, yeah you do though don't you i mean even the doctor when he's having his shrink sessions you just immediately don't trust him and no. you know that he's in on whatever it is and obviously that's great and frustrating as an audience member because every time you know billy hands him uh any kind of information you know it's going to be used against him but um it's just that setup why do you think uh he's having these paranoid visions because we don't really ever get to find that out because no. it's there's, like <laughs> there's a few things in this i'll just say this now there's a few things in this film and the director himself knows that there are parts that are clunky and don't make sense and but fuck it but this you're right <laughs> is he having visions is it nightmares What's he anticipating and how? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Who knows? No. <laughs> I mean, bad stuff's about to happen. You sort of get, you get the vibe of that. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but he's, uh, then we, we see that he's, uh, he's in the, the debate team at school, isn't he? And they're debating. They're actually, again, it's just hitting you over the head with the fact that he isn't like the majority of Beverly Hills because they're debating about a conservative dress code at the school. Yeah. So it's just one by one. Well, having the hottest girl in school flash her fanny at him. That's right. And she, and this was, um, this was before Basic Instinct because that was 1992. So was it? I'm gonna. I'm so pleased you checked that. Yeah, yeah. So this is she. The uh, yeah, this girl Clarissa, um, who doesn't explain it all. Um, she is sat on the front row and yeah, flat. Uh, you know, swinging her legs open and closed. Literally, like for all to see in the mid mid. Um, that was good. and it was very distracting for him. <laughs> it was distracting for me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, his girlfriend's getting livid in the back row. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, it's great. It's, they're really just setting up all these teens and um, that real high school Beverly Hills life, which I, I fucking love that world. I always have. It was almost more um, well-observed. I mean, I know we, we keep referring it to a bit sort of ludicrous because obviously it's a horror movie with a lot of humour to it. It is ludicrous, but it was kind of well-observed and not totally unintelligent, the whole thing. It oh, was... absolutely. And, I, I, and yeah, I think with these sort of films, there's two horror uh, horror comedy, uh, and when I say horror comedy, two horrors that you laugh at that are of this ilk where it's the really um, clever deliberate comedy and it's satire mm. and it's also managing to be gross or scary or whatever it is that they're going for and then there's the ones that are earnest but are so bad that make you laugh so and yeah. i love each equally the ones that totally. are clever and make me laugh and the ones that don't mean to but often make me laugh even more yeah uh, the film that you you reviewed recently about the cat with the little <laughs> Uninvited. soul coming out i really got to see that <laughs> you would love it it's right <laughs> up your street i think yeah it's absolutely <laughs> it's got three cats i've probably been a bit nervous about the bunny end of it <laughs> oh yeah absolutely you'd always have one eye on them yeah <laughs> actually he, he he's that he's back at the doctors then um and it, he actually has a line when uh the doctor asks about his family and he literally says, oh, you know, one big happy family except for a little incest and psychosis. <laughs> and so he just says it, but he's saying it jokingly, but yeah. he's planting the seed for the... Uh... God, I missed that. That's brilliant. I see, I don't know how I managed to miss that. That's a line well, that's I wasn't probably... sure if he had said it, so I did rewind it and he definitely does <laughs> say it. Um, but this is now when we 
first see a glimpse of what the fuck is going on with this family because Jenny's in the shower, right? His sister. And this bit, I this honestly made me feel really uncomfortable. So yeah. again, it's got the ancestral undertone and uh, he he's trying to find his sister Jenny and he goes to the shower and it's, uh, it's frosted glass so you can just see the outline of her and you can see a bit of her. And um, her body is twisted the wrong way around. So her face and her boobs are facing the front, but so is her her bum yeah and so uh, it's really it actually do you know um e- evil dead 2 yes the, the bit where she's dancing sort of like the doll it kind of reminds me of that it's got a similar but this i found it so fucking creepy and then he opens the uh the fridge no she's not in the fridge he opens the shower yeah. you know, <laughs> and she's the right way round. but uh then we've got the beach the beach the beach which is kind of um i, I even with the shower scene i wasn't massively on edge i think i was on edge at the beginning yeah uh wait it when when we, we thought something awful was going to happen and then the shower scene weirdly didn't freak me out the beach bit scared me for all the wrong reasons <laughs> so they're lying on their towel they're with with the actual girlfriend not yeah. Clarissa at this stage uh, shana i think yeah. and and uh shana's a bit of a prude um She's not gay, but she's not putting out in the same way. But she kind of wants to be part of society. She still wants to be moving up the chain, should we say? Yeah. Um, the hierarchy is interesting to her, and and she um, then once she spots the guy. What's the guy's name? Ted, um, who's the top boy, the, the kind of the quarterback. You kind of say the star quarterback kind of guy, isn't he? And he's yeah. uh, he ho- hosts legendary exclusive parties here in his family, and she wants to get into this party yeah and at that point i'm just like this never happens at all when i was a kid exclusive (laughs) parties family parties can you imagine so uh you know the thing that freaked me out the most about this the bit with the two kids like scurry along yes the background i'm like what the fuck are they doing yeah pesky children yeah and then they literally just squirt sun cream in their faces but what's that meta what's that a metaphor i mean it's i i I mean your your brain can go wherever you want because obviously it, it splatters on their faces and it again it's a sort of foreshadowing. I think everything in this just is a foreshadowing of the goo fest that comes towards the end, yeah. which I can't wait to get to. So that's why I am. I know it's like, <laughs> but um, but then we fi- we get find out a bit more because the ex boyfriend of Jenny, his sister, um, he gets onto the beach and he takes Bill to the pier and he says, "I've got this recording," and he plays it and it's this again. This honestly freak me out i think it is because it's this in, uh, incestuous thing because it's it's sort of new ground for me <laughs> and not something i'm used to so it, it bugged me and it's this recording of jenny and his and her parents and billy's parents and um they're talking about her coming out and uh, about how at first she'll copulate with someone her own age and then she'll copulate with her mum and her dad and then the host I not there's not I can't think of films like this. It's so unique. Yeah, it's there's nothing like it, and I can't I can't even think of anything like like it out of this genre. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's completely unique, and it's it's crossing a boundary. And and you're right. It's it's sort of something which you can't find this humorous. It's weird. It's yeah. like it's uh, it's thoroughly uncomfortable. Yeah, it's a no go area. Yeah, it's really a no go <laughs> area, but it's not conventional horror uncomfortable it's just like oh this is a bit odd <laughs> just yeah. makes you feel a bit icky yeah um, that's perfect icky's the word yeah and and just like where and again it's like this is kind of fascinating uh where like where this is going to be leading yeah and he takes he takes the tape to his shrink uh, to say look you know basically he wants to go look i'm not mad there is something happening i'm not yeah fucking crackers and um there's a great line uh, the great line that the the doctor then says to him, he says, you know, because this is bad, you're re- recording people without their permission. He says, you have to follow society's rules of privacy. If you don't follow the rules, bad things happen. Some people make the rules and some people follow the rules. It's a question of what you're born to. I mean, that there. Ta-da! On a plate. There you go. There's there the we film. go. <laughs> There's the film. It's absolutely true. Um, yeah. And then, uh, so he, <laughs> that's the thing, the tape, is then changed and it doesn't have all this this information on. It's something completely different and the conversation sounds different. Again, this isn't addressed how this happens. Kind of impossible, but it doesn't matter. So it just makes uh, Billy look mad. And so he uh, arranges to get another copy off his friend or uh, his sister's ex. Yeah. Um, and, when he, but, and when he goes to meet him, he's dead, of course, because yeah. the society have got to him and they've crashed his car. So he goes to 
Clarissa's house, who's the the girl, right? The uh, the leg opening girl. <laughs> I mean, that's really a degrading way of describing it. We have to rewind quickly about the mum, Clarissa's mum on the beach. Oh my god, how the hell? My favourite character in the film. Sh- first of all, I had to check that it wasn't divine. Right. This this woman is just she's she's. Uh, we shouldn't be refer- for referring to people's image but she's a she's a big woman she's a larger woman she's very tall and she's wearing divine style drag makeup right and exactly. she doesn't have the power of speech and um she has a very very low um baritone grunting voice and she's yeah. just this force almost like uh you can't tell if she's a zombie yeah like she's got she's got nothing she's not really got anything to say but it's sort of like it's like she's lo- lobotomized. That's yeah. the best way of describing it. And um, but yeah, we meet her again later, and yeah. <laughs> it's just so bizarre. We're at Clarissa's house, and they're sort of making out on the sofa, and you're suddenly like Clarissa's into this. And also, I was thinking, what a dickhead! He's got a girlfriend. Oh, I wasn't. I was Were thinking you? his girlfriend's really boring. Clarissa's <laughs> way better. <laughs> well, no, I don't. I don't disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Not interesting at all. <laughs> oh, but yeah. Um, but yeah, but you believe that Clarissa's going to be, like, involved. Um, and then the mum walks in um, and burps up a hairball like yes. a cat. Yeah, this is... <laughs> right, this bit... I mean, it's. I'm so glad it's in the film, but it is so bizarre. It's never explained, one, what happened to her, um, two, why she's coughing up hairballs. And there's a great moment where she, she just goes... and coughs up the hairball... And before she goes to hand it to Billy, he's already proffered his hand out to take it. <laughs> it's a really weird moment. Like, yeah. <laughs> but also, was did we see the girlfriend ever again, by the way? Uh, oh, she, um, it was a blonde hairball and the girlfriend was blonde. That's right. Well, when he does eventually go to the party... So, oh, yeah, she yeah. is. Uh, she's someone, there or, or no her friend's there and then she tells her that he was kissing another girl or something that was like it because they're in the bushes I remember there we go sorry I was like oh maybe that's what happened <laughs> um, <laughs> right. making, making our, our extra subplots on top of the subplots <laughs> but uh, I, I just love the do you know the, the mother the uh, Clarissa's mum um, it really makes me think of uh, yeah just a, a John Waters film character mm. it's exactly it's got to be some sort of homage to John Waters because it's straight out of one of his films, and I absolutely love it. There is a bit of Crybaby in this, in the whole narrative as well, actually. Yes. Um, like, what's the girl in Crybaby? Mo- oh, mo- um, motor mouth. Uh, no, it's be- not baby face. Oh, God. Oh, something, something face. face. Hatchet face. Yeah, hatchet face, that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's who <it> <laughs> We went through all the faces we got there. And, uh, oh, speaking of faces, so he goes back to his parents, and uh, him... His parents and his sister, they're all massaging each other. It's very odd. Again, I felt icky. And um, he says to his dad, which is a very poignant line because of later, he says, fuck you, butthead. Uh, this, that's, I've written that down twice as well. <laughs> <laughs> the final line, but we know why. Yeah, it's genius. <laughs> Arguably the best scene in the whole film. Totally. Then another bit that's really doesn't make sense and confusing. They go, he goes to um, Blanchard's uh, funeral and... Uh, He's lying in the coffin. Uh, this is the ex-boyfriend of the, the sister. And he, he touches his face and his hand kind of goes through his, uh, his cheek and his face. But this whole, the whole thing about that. So there's a lot of um, sort of morphing, metamorphosing into yeah. one another, which I'm assuming is the well, power that's... of what they're achieving from each other. Yeah, I get that. But, th- but he comes back later. Oh, yeah. When they drag him back in to use him as a sort of sacrifice. So he's alive. And so maybe it's just a cool effect and they wanted to pop it in. I mean, yeah, clunky is definitely the word. Like, <laughs> doesn't make any sense. But I loved it. <laughs> so almost, almost it doesn't need to. You're sort of left. Because I actually, I, you're right. I remember thinking that at the time, then just moving on really quickly and completely forgetting that he'd um, he'd actually even had a funeral by the end scene. Yeah. So... No, it's just, it's just a quite a random scene but again yeah i'm happy to have it <laughs> really, yeah i really don't mind with shit like that um then i uh, mean like you said it's surrealist so it's like i suppose the world is your is your literal oyster i mean it, you don't get much more creative than this kind of this kind of filmmaking do you it's no. really and it's uh it's just it, and it was of a time when um it just took 
loads of people thinking of the maddest things they could do and they'd create that and then backtrack and make the story work around it and that's what brian uh usner said about this you know they'd come up with concepts of visuals and then somehow go back and just try and weave the story to to make sure they can have it in yeah exactly i think i might do that with my life from now on (laughs) (laughs) think of this big visual goal that you want do it and And then then decide yeah work out how we get there in afterwards (laughs) yeah just do it um we have a, another one of these great lines when um, the cops think that uh, Billy's making everything up. And uh, the cop says, um, I think it's one of the most crucial lines of the film. He says, God, he says, God, is it really that boring being rich because he's making up all this shit? And I think that is the crux of the film. Um, because what do the rich do when they've bought everything they want? So, And, it, you know, you can also think uh, it's sort of talking about hunting as well. And that sort of what what else is there we can do to use our money in power and uh yeah i mean I, I it's always been my biggest fascination as well even in, in like when you're a, like a massive like musician if you once you've reached the pinnacle of whatever mm. it's like you fucked everyone <laughs> you literally fucked everyone <laughs> right. and like and you're you know what's next and it i mean uh, you know i keep referring to this army hammer case but if it is true it's like you're in society you've got you've reached your peak you've been damaged by whatever and what's next um, and then like yeah sure why not eat someone <laughs> <laughs> why not <laughs> i mean there's many reasons why not well, but... right. <laughs> yeah it's true it is that what else can we do uh, so we have Bill now and he goes home and this is this is what we've been waiting for this is where it all starts to kick off there's a weird thing though they um his parents are there and so is all the society when he gets back home and they they drug him with a needle right and put him to sleep and then he just wake kind of just wakes up in hospital and walks out and i'm not too sure what all this is about what the point was no. it's like that i think maybe it was i i felt like it was indicating that he, this is what's been going on the whole time that he's actually been passed out and and actually like having to be kept away from it they don't necessarily want to eat him oh my uh, he God. is part of the family but he's, um, but he's actually like they're kind of actually doing it in a slightly saving him way. Also, one of the things that they say quite a lot is you you have to have the blood. You have to have the blood. So are they suggesting that he's adopted or something? I could work yeah, that out. Yeah, they do do uh, they do sort of mention it later, um, and they it's not fully explained. But they kind of had to bring up someone that they could eventually sacrifice to spike the uh, the bloodline. Yeah, uh, and keep it and keep it uh, existing. So I mean, it's it's a stretch, but um, <laughs> that that's the reason that they've adopted him and brought him up. It's like a sort of Hansel and Gretel sort of fattening him up type <laughs> thing. <laughs> that's how I kind of see it. And uh, but yeah, so he, he he wakes up, he gets out of the hospital, um, and then he um, he goes to Clarissa's again, and um, they have a bit of a, a slap around. They slap each other a little bit, just you know, as you do. And but she warns him. She says, "Don't." don't go home yeah when he but doesn't he starts to get like really um at that point when he's been injected i i wasn't sure if he'd been injected with something that was making him uh he's a bit off his face isn't he yeah because he's he suddenly becomes like abusive and a bit cocky as well yeah uh, yeah and he's sort of a bit glazed over you're right yeah yeah so I just wasn't sure if he was like, oh, I suddenly thought maybe they've injected whatever it, with wherever it is he needs to be able to be one of them. Oh, maybe, yeah. Uh, yeah but it's, but it's, he didn't. It's not really. It's not It's not really explained. <laughs> That's no. That's the thing, a lot of this. <laughs> um, but uh, this is it. Yeah, so he gets he gets back to his house and uh, the society there. And um, the uh, the leader, the sort of the lead guy, the host, the coach guy, he, um, he says, you're another one of these sentences, paragraph lines that sum it all up. You know, he says, you're a different race from us. Oh, I've got it in quotes. So I will say, yeah. it. I'll say it in his voice. You're a different race from us, uh, a different species, a different class. You're not one of us. You have to be born into the society. We're not from another planet. We've been here as long as you have. It's a matter of good breeding. And again, it's in some of those smack in your face lines. And I love it. And, um, and it's sort of it's like very ostracizing suddenly it's like right here we are then <laughs> you're definitely not as good as us you might have been brought up with us but you ain't us no um, and yeah that's the the entire message of the whole thing isn't it the um yeah just they are another race and um they, there's, <laughs> there's um, a platter of slugs which i think they're snacking on i don't know but um everyone starts no, to i thought get... they were leeches oh are they leech that makes yeah. more sense there's another metaphor yeah 
Oh, exactly. Nice, nice spot. See, that's why you're here. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, we don't even have to unpick that one. That metaphor. I think that's pretty, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much there. Uh, they get into their underwear, um, and then this is what they call shunting. So, for anyone who hasn't seen <laughs> the film, basically, what it is is kind of like an orgy where they all meld into one being so all their skin melts into each other and they so if you they'll start maybe by sucking on someone's neck and then their lips become part of their neck and their, yep. their skin stretches like melted cheese and they yeah. absorb whoever it is is the sacrifice and the first person is david the blanchard the um the ex-boyfriend right yeah and uh yes yeah, so they've got the two of them they're gonna eat and absorb david and then they're gonna uh, do it to to billy and um yeah and another one of those lines he says before they start melting into uh blanchard they said the rich have always sucked off low class shit like you yeah <laughs> so good <laughs> um but you really if if people haven't seen this it really is <laughs> something to see i've never seen anything like it i mean it's an orgy like no other that's for sure <laughs> it's it's um because you know that it's sexual. There's no getting away from uh-huh. it. They are they are completely getting uh, kicks from it in a way that we can only imagine. And and the the sort of the, they literally like you said it melts like cheese into one another and and to a point where they're like become funnels and they're pouring champagne into <laughs> any hole funnels, available. Yeah. Any hole available. And it's really interesting because you have got somebody like basically giving a blowjob, but like. Where they but it's turned into like a, a vacuum where they're actually pouring in champagne. Right. It's like, what's going on here? <laughs> and what fucking genius is this? Exactly, it's like... it is such a genius. And um, actually, this the whole the shunt. Um, it was um the uh, uh scream mad George. He was inspired by two Dali paintings. Actually, one called Autumnal Cannibalism and one called Premonition of Civil War. I know both of them very well, and right. it makes perfect sense. Right, exactly. Wow. So that it's that that stretched body parts and odd placement of limbs. I and love stuff. hearing that. That's absolutely genius, and and the fact that it is about cannibalism through through Dali as well. That's right, absolutely very sweet. Yeah, it's so clever, and um and um yeah. Again, when you hear that, you just go, oh, this is inspired. This shit. It's so. It's it's smart. It is. You smart. know. There's no, I mean, we, we, listening to some of the other podcasts you, that you, you've done, it was like a lot of this is sort of slightly gratuitous and things like this. Yeah. This has got guts. Literally. <laughs> plenty of guts. <laughs> um, it's meaningful. You yeah. walk away from this going, right, and actually to have that kind of like substance behind it. Yeah, when it makes a statement and grosses you out and makes you laugh, it's it's a winning formula. And they, um, the actor said that, you know, when they were, when they were filming this this shunting scene where they were melting into each other they said you know the start of the shooting day was really exciting and fun that's day one of course but it wore off really quickly because everyone was so uncomfortable they're glued to other people and you know oh. they couldn't they couldn't rip the prosthetics so they had to stay in certain positions for a long time they used you know all the gunge that's on them um, apparently that's food thickener which you might know I don't know yeah, it'll be it'll be um, xanthan gum, right. so uh, which is used a lot nowadays. I'm actually surprised that it probably wasn't used uh, really for what it should be used back in those days. Right. So uh, well, it's very yeah. effective because it's it's not runny, but it's also not it's bouncy. pure slime. Yeah. Yeah, I used it in my my vegan burgers recently. <laughs> it's the thing that gives it the bounce and the bite, but also it's got it holds, it clings. Well, it's um, there was an inspired choice. Yeah. And um, screaming mad George, so he. In the uh, pre-production for this, uh, the whole thing was only filmed in five weeks, I think, the whole film. Um, But he had to sculpt, cast and paint this because uh, the main shunt is five five main people all stuck together and um, he had to do all of those things in just six weeks and he basically didn't sleep. And um, he had one day to sculpt each piece of the five and um apparently you'd normally need about five days per piece so he was really pushed but i think honestly there's something about the result of the the rushed and time constrained creation that works so well and makes it more stomach churning because it looks like a work in progress it's raw it's crude and i think Mm. if there were if it was more polished and detailed it wouldn't quite have the same effect because i i also think that sometimes time can be a hindrance because when you have time to change your instincts and edit your gut decisions, 
you often take away the soul of the art itself and it loses its glow of conception. Oh, entirely. I mean, uh, you know, and this this has got to be... I mean, this was pre-CGI and everything, oh, so yeah. it was all, it was all done in, in... Yeah, pr- exactly, practically. Um, and I imagine uh, learning on the job as well, which is just kind of, yeah. And it, and it does, it feels very raw. I mean, all, all of the words that we were saying earlier. We've forgotten to talk about, though, that there's the subplot with, with the divine character. Like, what's going on with that? What happened where? That, I lost that at the end. She, so she, she ends up uh, with the best friend of Billy, driving round. Milo, the, uh, yeah, Billy's friend. And that, yeah, she's in the back of the car. Mugging a policeman. <laughs> Of their clothes. She gets to eat him? I don't know if she's even a cannibal. I mean, she's clearly a cannibal. It doesn't make... Again, it's... Because she threw up a hairball, you kind of think she's... (laughs) She must be involved in it, but she's not part of this shunting and this part of the society. It's... I don't really know. That is a, you know, a a sideline plot that's going on. Um, Doesn't really go anywhere, but I'm... The more more screen time that Clarissa's mum has got, I'm down for it. And, and, you know, the whole feasting scene is done to the, the Blue Danube, and it's a Johann Strauss thing. Mm. And even that in itself is like, it's almost like American Psycho, you know? That <laughs> juxtaposition. Yeah. All the, um, actually, the, uh, the very, the music in this, the very opening uh, credits, um, there's this sort of haunting song about society playing. And apparently it is the... Etonian, as in Eton School, apparently it's their school song that they've changed the lyrics oh, to. Oh, really? Yeah. That's fucking great. Isn't it? I love that. See, but that sort so of thing goes smart. right over your head unless, you know, then I looked up and I was like, fuck, that's just some subliminal little message, you know, about Etonians. And I think it's genius. And we have this, uh, the guy, this is when the guy gets, there's two moments when someone kind of gets ripped inside out, when they go in through the arsehole. <laughs> And then, and then the hand comes out of the face, through the eyeballs, through the mouth. It's genius. I mean, that's the end. That's the that's the finishing off of the the sort of uh, the, the jock king, bad guy, the yeah. king jog. But the best, the best bit for me, without any shadow of a doubt, is when he walks into the the incest scene with the mum, the dad, and the daughter. Yes. So it's like. So the, somebody's trying to inhibit him going through. It's like, let me give you a hand. And he literally pulls out a hand that's like attached to his body. Yes. That's not, not where a hand should be. Nope. And then um, walks through, ends up and his mum's lying on the bed. Uh, and she looks like the mum. And then soon you realise that the mum actually jumps up and she's got the dad's arms for legs. Yes. And sort of it's runs horrible. along. And then comes up to talk to the son who's like now carrying in the corner and the sister's head pops out of her pussy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, who thought of this? It's so good. Um, at which point the father's like jumps on top of the bed, like scurries along, and it's just a pair of arms, is it? Or oh, no, it's, it's an ass. It's legs, yeah, legs and an ass. Yeah. And then his head pops out of the arsehole. <laughs> and you're like, but, I mean, I was on the floor roaring with laughter at this point. For the things I'm trying to imagine now, someone listening to this who hasn't seen it and hearing you saying that and going, what the <laughs> fuck happens in this film? I'm sure so many new viewers, we're going to get so many new viewers of this film. I'm so grateful that I've seen it because you're right. It's like a surrealist masterpiece. Mm-hmm. That's why when we were, um, I just, uh, just from what I know about you, I think, um, you know, on surface level, I that's why I thought, oh, I just got this feeling this film is going to be right up her street and it's just yeah. going to land really well. Uh, so this all happens. And uh, then once he's pulled, uh, yeah, he's pulled uh, the uh, the main bad dude inside out, <laughs> as you do. Yeah. And he's full of worms and maggots. Um, him and, right, this is interesting. So he and Clarissa, who is one of them because we've seen her body sort of shift and contort they just go off and they jump in the jeep and escape and that is literally the end of the film and the credits roll and um we don't get any expl- well clarissa doesn't explain it all um but I, I guess i wonder if that is like i mean i can speak badly from that like i'm from a really posh family and i've never felt like at home in that right. in that world in that environment so i i get clarissa yeah oh i totally do and i because it's 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 littered all the way through, isn't it? That she's not quite conforming to yeah. what is being asked of her and what she's bred into, and uh, yeah, it's a lovely little uh, Romeo and Juliet escape at the end. Um, yeah, and that's 
that society. I just, I definitely appreciate it more now at this age because when I saw it, I do remember only renting it once. I think because it took so long to get to all the gooey shit. Um, yeah. Whereas this time I got the the nuanced comedy, the the undertones, well overtones, <laughs> and um, uh, and I I really appreciate it. I think it's extremely original. Um, there's a lot of um, Brian Usner. This was his directorial debut, and he had produced Reanimator and um, Honey I Shrunk the Kids and stuff. So oh, a lot of oh. sort of body stuff and um, body horror, I suppose, and playing with that idea. So this was his first. Uh, he said that um, he, he was producing, but then he realised that directors are the ones that get all the credit, so he wanted to do his own. Um, but I think he's created a really original, um, funny, gross out. And uh, again, this is, as I was saying, this makes me feel uncomfortable and icky, which it's hard to get, rouse any kind of strong feelings from me with horror anymore. I feel the same. Like, am I a, am a psychopath? I can't tell. Right. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like... <laughs> I mean, I've literally watched horror movies uh almost daily uh to kind of try and get a reaction and not often do you get one mm. and even and even if it's not the reaction that you'd expect from a horror movie it's like um it's definitely it riles up something and mm-hmm. and on top of anything it's just um like you said it's so original i mean i can't think of anything i mean even even when you look at the sort of integration of how the bodies are aligned and the bodily fluids and all of this i mean even the human centipede is is sort of like Kick to the curb. Well, yeah, slightly absolutely. on this. Yeah, I mean, this very much paved the way for that sort of film in in that respect. And um, there's that film. Do you remember Sliver that was out in oh, yeah. sort of early two thousands? I think it was. And that has a moment where uh, creatures like this are in it. So um, and teeth influence. for me, yes, as well. Where it's just like your the consumption of of the human and the need to consume is is um, yeah. Ah, I feel oh. really good. I feel better after this conversation about it. I feel like it needs an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to it really doesn't need an Oscar. So, no, but I I don't think... Um, I mean, in uh, my sort of horror communities, we all know what it is. And if you haven't seen it, you, you at least know images from it. Um, but I think it's a cracking, well, perfectly pitched film. Yep, it's it's... Superb. Thank you very much. But listen, I, you were the perfect person to talk to about this and I'm absolutely <laughs> chuffed. And um, now that I know just how into horror you are, you, I'm going to force you now to agree to come back and maybe we'll do Brain Dead. Okay. Oh, that'd be good. I haven't seen it for years. I mean, actually, I haven't seen it for years. I, I started to download it, but I did actually feel fall asleep through it the other day. So maybe I'll save it. Right. Well, I'll 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 pencil you in for that, and I I um I won't cover it until we can find a uh, good time to set aside, and we'll do it together. You, you've got my thirst for it, and um for I my neighbour is uh, she works for Lionsgate, and she um she said they've got the new saw coming out in the summer. So um, if we're allowed to go to a premiere, I'm going to scoop you up and you're coming with me. All right, I have evidence of you saying that now. It's recorded. <laughs> well, I'm going to like rugby tackle you into the premiere Oh, you won't me. need to rugby tackle me. I'll be there two days before camping out. Saw is like, Brain Dead's my number one, but Saw is probably my very close number well, two. Well, again, that I'm... is... that's. A genius film. I, I mean, the uh, the uh, the franchise itself ran off in a different direction, but the original film, the concept of just two people in a room with a dead body, what what can you do with the, what can you do with it, and what they did is fucking amazing. And it's, it's I think so it's the most successful franchise uh, horror franchise of all time now. I think it's really it it's taken in. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Anyway, uh, listen. Well, until we meet again for either uh, the uh, Spiral premiere or Brain Dead. Uh, thank you so much, Gizzy Erskine. Thank you. Bye bye. There we are. That was Society from 1989. Thank you so much, Gizzy Erskine. Um, that was so much fun. And um, you all heard her, right? She went on record saying that she would take me to the Spiral premiere and she'll be back on to do Brain Dead. Um, that is now out there, so that has to happen. Um, if you'd like to get in touch, please find us on the socials. On Twitter, it's Stevie's Brain Rot. On Instagram, it's Brain Rot Pod. Or you can email the show, which is Stevie's Brain Rot at gmail.com. Until next time, ghouls, toodles.